The UCAT is arguably the most important, yet the most time pressured and stressful part of the entire med or dental school application. However, with the right information and planning, it can actually be made to be quite an enjoyable process. In this video, we're gonna talk about all of these things in the attempt to do just that. So this is going to serve as a complete guide to the UCAT, knowing everything that you need to know, why they ask the questions we do, and that's gonna help us get into the mindset so that we can answer the questions the best possible and get the highest possible score. So first, let's start with what the UCAT is. The UCAT consortium on their website say that the University Clinical Aptitude Test is an admissions test used by a consortium of UK universities for their medical and dental degree programs. The UCAT helps universities to select applicants with the most appropriate mental abilities, attitudes, and professional behaviors required for new doctors and dentists to be successful in their clinical careers. It is used in collaboration with other admissions processes such as the UCAS application and academic qualifications. It is also your opportunity to stand out from other applicants and demonstrate your aptitude for a demanding program of study. In summary, it's a test to see if you have the abilities that they deem important to make a good dentist or doctor. Ultimately, the important things to know are that it's a two hour computer-based test that sat in a test center. You can do it in the UK for £70 or abroad for £150. Bursaries are also available. It has five sections, usually sit it between mid-July to the end of September and ultimately the test is there and it's designed to test the abilities that they deem important to make a good doctor or dentist and it contributes to the selection process for your medical or dental school selection. On the screen now I'm going to put up some key dates that you need to know with reference to the UCAT exam. The main thing you need to know is that of when the test booking date opens. It's really important because the UCAT exam is absolutely packed and when you come on to do that, treat that as if you are trying to get a hot concert ticket and you just want to make sure that you get on bang on when it opens so that you don't miss out because if you're in a popular place like London and you want a very desirable time then they get sold out very very quickly within the first hour of the booking opening. Also important to note that it takes quite a while to complete the registration so don't leave this until the day that the booking opens. Registration opens a few weeks before so you can get that completed in that time. So as I said before the UCAT is split into five sections which I'm going to put on screen now to give you an idea of how many questions you get for each and the time that is allocated to each section. So let's go through each section and see what the UCAT consortium say. The first is the verbal reasoning, and that subtest assesses your ability to read and think carefully about information presented in passages. Ultimately, what's gonna happen is when you become a doctor or a dentist, you will have to sift through lots of notes when a new patient comes and try and get a comprehensive but quick understanding of what is going on with them. This is testing that very same ability. Then we have decision-making, which assesses your ability to apply logic and reach a decision or conclusion. As it suggests, this is one that wants to test your logical reasoning abilities. Then we have the quantitative reasoning, which tests that you have an adequate level of math skills to do all the calculations required in the day-to-day -day of being a doctor. After that, we have the abstract reasoning which as the name suggests tests your ability to think outside of the box it's a bit more like an IQ test where you get lots of shapes and patterns and you have to try and work out what's going on the final one is the situational judgment test now this is different from the first four sections because they are marked from scores 300 to 900 so the maximum that you can get for the first four sections is 3600 however the SJT is scored separately and you can get a maximum of band one then you have band two three and four being the lowest now this is more to test your situational awareness what you should do in a given circumstance and also test your understanding of ethics and what's a reasonable course of action in a difficult circumstance. I'm not going to go too deep into these sections now because I've made an entire playlist that breaks down every single section, helps you fully understand what you need to know and it will give you a really good guide there. What we're going to do now is talk about our goals and how we're going to reach a high score. So when we're sitting in the UCAT, we're going to have one of two goals. We either have a university in mind and we know what score we need to get. Let's say, for example, we want to apply to Bristol. We know that last year the score was 2,730 to get in. So that is kind of our goalpost for what we're aiming for. The other goal is just that we're going to go for it, go as hard as we can, get as high a score as possible, see where that leaves us and see what universities are available to us once we've got our score. A useful thing to know is that when you sit your UCAT, you actually get the score immediately on completion of the exam. That doesn't tell you exactly where you lie compared to everybody else in your year because not everyone else has sat the test, but when you compare it to previous years, you're usually within a decile of where you normally land. So each year it's ranked from one to 10 deciles. So if you can be in the first, you can be in the 10th or anywhere in the middle, and you'll know roughly within one decile where you land within that once you've got your score. You can only sit the UCAT once per admission cycle. So in that July to September period, you only get one go at it. 
If you don't get the UCAT score that you were hoping for, check out this video here because there are still options for that admission cycle and I wouldn't necessarily recommend that you don't apply because you can do stuff about it with even an average or even sometimes a low UCAT score. Each university is very different in how they use the UCAT score. Some will have an overall cutoff score, some do it very differently like for example Nottingham, they will take the verbal reasoning and count that as double and then weight that towards your entire score. Some will have a minimum so no one section can be below 500 for example. Some will take the average of the first four sections and have a minimum cutoff score there rather than a cutoff overall score and some will not have a cutoff at all but will assess your score holistically compared to the rest of your application which means they factor in your personal statement, your work experience and various other aspects of the application. In other words what I'm trying to say is that it varies massively by uni but actually if you go on the UCAT consortium website it will actually tell you uni by uni how they use the UCAT score. However some of them are a bit vague and not particularly useful so I'll show you a link to a website in the description below where you can get more detailed information about exactly what the university does. A question that my students on my Future Doc Academy which you can check out here that they ask me a lot is what is a good score? What should I aim for? I always say that about 75 to 80 percent will get you a score of 2700 across the VR, QR, AR and decision making and an SJT band 1 will get you in the top decile. Now if you're a GEM applicant, like I say, deciles you can almost ignore because you have to get normally beyond the threshold for the top decile to get into most universities. That's how competitive the UCAT score is for GEM applicants and if you want to know more about that you can check out this playlist here that I've made specifically for GEM applicants. However, if you're applying to the five year undergrad course then the chances are that a score like that will land you in the top decile and certainly won't be the thing that will stop you from getting a place when you apply to university. Okay so let's look at some hard numbers. Of course this changes year by year but typically the average score for the first four sections lies somewhere between 620 and 630. So for example in 2019 the average score for the UCAT first four sections was 620, in 2020 it was 628 and then in 2021 it was 625 and typically in any given section a score of over 650 would be considered a good score and a high score would be 680. When you take it section by section verbal reasoning is usually the worst performing one. Typically an average is about 570 something like that and quantitative reasoning is usually the one that people do best in with an average score of around 665. Then abstract reasoning you can have a range from about 630 to 650 as the average and decision making year by year is massively variable. When it comes to SJT you want to be aiming for the top two bands. But like I say, if you're applying as a grad, I would almost ignore the deciles. For example, Newcastle last year needed 2,920 just to be considered to be invited for interview for their grad spots. If you want to check out a story from one of our students and how they got over 3,000, you can check out this video here. But for now, let's have a look at the numbers and see how they're going to help us plan to get a high score. So one thing that I would recommend is that you go on the UCAT consortium website and they will show you the statistics for last year, which I will flash on screen now. A useful thing to note is that about halfway through September the UCAT will actually release some interim data for how it's going with the first half of that cohort. This is really useful for using that data to apply strategically if you're not confident that you've got a really high score. If you want to learn more about how to apply strategically, you can check out this video here. And I've just made a little table for you that's gonna break down what it took to get in each decile year by year over the last few years. And then I'm also gonna show you what the average score per section was over the last few years as well. And then finally, you can see what distribution of people landed in the different bands for the SJT. Another question I get frequently from my students is when should I actually sit the UCAT? There's a wide window from mid-July to the end of September and a lot of variance for when you could sit it. So I always say that there are three things that you need to consider when timing your UCAT exam. The first is of course that you need to make sure you've got enough time to prepare and we'll talk about how long you should allow to prepare a bit later. The second is that you need to have it minimally encroach on your other important activities. So that's your exams, if you're sitting the A-levels, if you've got uni exams, just make sure that it's minimally impacting those. The third one is that you want to do it early enough to make sure that you've got time for a plan B. So that could be sitting the GAMSAT if you're a grad applicant, if you're um, an undergrad applicant you could sit the BMAT for example, or just it just gives you a bit of time to think tactically based on your score as to where you're going to apply and how you're going to tailor your application 
application based on those university selections. So now let's take a moment to look at when and how we should prepare, including what resources we should use. I always teach that there are three phases of preparation for the UCAT. The first is familiarization, where you try and understand all the questions, all the things that might come up, and specifically the techniques that are gonna make you go in the fastest way possible and the most accurate. This is something I recommend you do at a leisurely pace and you can just take your time over. I'd recommend an online course such as mine, it's 20 hours, it covers every single possible question that you can get in the UCAT and the most proven, speedy and accurate technique to tackle it. If you want the light summary version of that, you can get a taster from this playlist here. It will give you the basics and get you going, but probably not enough to go to the level of depth that you need to get a 3000 plus score. Phase two is then to go on to practice questions. I would recommend doing them online because the test itself is online and just make sure that you don't time yourself to start with. You want to ensure that you're getting 80% accuracy before you move on to time questions. I also recommend that you take one section at a time because you'll see much more improvement if you focus on just one rather than doing all five and trying to improve them all at the same time. Then. Once you're ready to move on to time questions, this could be anything from three weeks to three months prior to the exam. And it really depends on you and your personal abilities and comfort level with the high speed of the UCAT exam. I would recommend that quite early on you do a mock exam to use as a calibration tool for kind of how well you're doing and how much work you think you might need to get the score that you need. You can use the official UCAT mocks on their website, but I would use them sparingly because they're the only true accurate test that you can use that are kind of a reliable resource that you can go against. So if you're going to use it, make sure you get the most out of it. Go through the answers at the end, understand why you got the ones wrong, but more importantly, why the ones you got right as well are there. So I would say what you want to do is start with a slow time that you can manage and then just slowly, bit by bit, keep doing a little bit more practice, just slowly increasing the time each time gradually building up that skill, getting faster and faster. And finally, the most important thing is I would say keep track of your score because that's the only way that you can truly monitor your progress. So when people say, how long do I prepare for? Just use your performance in those mocks to gauge how far off you think you are from the score you need to be. Just remember your goal and think how likely am I to get there or how much work am I gonna need to put in to reach that level? But when people are really keen about the UCAT and it's more than three months out or four months out, they often ask me, well, what, what should I do now? Well, this is a great time I would say to start familiarizing yourself with everything so do something like I say like my online course or just another book I recommend mainly online resources but just Familiarize yourself with the questions, get used to having a go at them, understand the techniques and how to use them, and then kind of treat it more as a, like how people may, might do a Sudoku at night or just some brain teasers. And that way it will make it much more enjoyable and something that you're doing kind of as a brain challenge to yourself rather than something like, oh, this is an exam that I seriously have to revise for and making it really stressful. If you can make it enjoyable and something that you do as a challenge to yourself rather than a really serious thing, then it will make the whole process much easier. Because another common question that I get asked is how much actually each day should I be spending on the UCAT? How much time should I put in? How much revision? So first I'm going to give you a quick analogy of how you should think about the UCAT. I always say that the UCAT is a bit like sprint training. Now when you think about how sprinters train, what they don't do is sprint constantly all day for five, eight hours just non-stop. Because you can imagine when you're sprinting the idea is to train yourself to be as fast as possible. So what you'll do is you'll sprint, go as fast as you can, and and then take really long breaks to recover. Then you'll take a bit of a break and then you'll go for it again and recover. But what people do is often the opposite. What they try and do is these marathon UCAT sessions where they'll go for five hours non-stop and then they'll be surprised why their score's getting worse. It's because your brain is tired and it's not able to keep up with the high intensity that's demanded of it. Like I say, it is like a sprint for that specific couple of hours while you're doing that test. So treat it like sprint training. Treat it like a performance that you have to deliver those skills on demand at the time of the test. Because what people confuse the UCAT with is that it's not like your GCSEs, your A-levels, where there's a body of knowledge that you have to understand, remember, and then regurgitate or get asked questions about directly. It's a set of skills and tasks that they want to see you be able to do under pressure at a given time. So just like a sprinter, they're training themselves to perform on the big game day, on big race day, so that they can do the best they can then. And that's exactly how you should view it. So it's a two hour test, so I would recommend that you do no more than two or three hours in a given session. 
If you get a good rest and you feel like you're ready to go again, maybe later in the day after you've taken a long break, you can do another session. But just like I say, keep yourself well preserved and make sure that you've got the energy and focus to really give it your all and do that sprint of the test. Remember that after you've done a learning session of anything, a 10 minute yoga nidra session, which you can find anywhere on YouTube, you can find some free meditations there. They're proven to increase retention by 50%. So all the lessons that you've learned, you'll remember another half on top of what you remembered already just by doing that 10 minute session at the end of your study session. One of the key tactical questions I get is, should I work on the areas that I'm weak on, on those sections, or should I double down and increase the score on the ones that I'm naturally good at already? Well, when answering this, I always think that it's important to go back to your original goal. Are you just trying to get the best you can? Do you think that an hour spent on quantitative reasoning, if you're already good at maths, will increase your score by 20 points, whereas doing verbal reasoning, which you're not so good at, an hour spent might only increase them by 10 points. Does that matter? Because if you're trying to get the better overall score, then yeah, of course, that would be the best way to go. However, if you're applying to a university that has a cutoff score, and if you get below 500 in the verbal reasoning, then you won't be eligible to apply to that university, then that's something to consider as well. So you need to weigh up and go back to your original goal as to why you're doing this, what you're aiming for, and how it will guide your training. So if you got to this far in the video, I'm going to thank you by giving you five tips that I recommend you should do now to ensure that you get a 3000 plus score. The first thing I would say is to, at this stage, really lay the groundwork and get to that 80% understanding so that you're getting most of the questions correct. I would say that it's really important to understand all the questions, the key techniques, the most effective and most speedy ones, and more importantly, why they work. My online course which you can check out here is by far the best way to do that and make sure you have a really solid foundation and understanding. My second tip is to reiterate just how important it is to focus on one section at a time. Again, I'll show you my favorite example from this book, which is if you look here, it shows the difference between focusing on loads of different things and showing just marginal improvement in a million areas versus being laser focused on one and just by focusing on that one thing, having a way bigger impact in your efforts. And my third tip, which actually relates to the previous one, is that once you feel like you've got good at a section and you understand it well, I won't say mastered, but once you move on to the next one, just occasionally come back and practice again once in a while, just the previous sections, just to leave them on maintenance. The analogy I use is a bit like spinning plates. When people are spinning plates, what they do is they'll put a new plate up and they'll put loads and loads of effort in to get it going, but then occasionally they'll have to go back to the other plates and just do a few little repetitions on them just to make sure everything's spinning and keeping from falling. My fourth tip is to highlight just how important it is to practice on a screen. It's very tempting to get a book and bury your head in that, but remember that the UCAT test is on a computer. It feels different, it looks different, and it just generally is different. So you have to go fast, and I say that the best way to do that is to practice by simulating the test as much as possible in your practice. So practicing on a computer will help you get used to it more and just go faster when it comes to the real thing. My fifth and final tip is to do whatever you can to make the UCAT as enjoyable as possible. Like I say, you can treat these like little brain teasers and challenge yourself and kind of try and make them as fun as possible. If you can try and make yourself enjoy these the same the way that you would a Sudoku or a brain teaser, it will just make the whole thing more enjoyable and that will contribute to you getting a higher score. So I hope you find that useful. If you want a little bit more about the UCAT where I go into depth in each of the sections, check out this playlist here. Otherwise, if you want me to coach you one-on-one -on -one to help you get a 3000 plus UCAT score, I recommend that you check out this video here where I teach you about my academy and how we teach our students to do well.